And it was astonishing what I saw. Jesus sails the sea with a crew, that is, his disciples, that are not nearly as noble as he is, like Odysseus. Like Odysseus, Jesus keeps his identity a secret so his enemies can't kill him. The Jewish authorities play the role of of Penelope's suitors. They love the best seats in uh, synagogues, and they're willing to kill in order to uh, win the inheritance. Um, Judas plays the role of Melanthius, Jesus' turncoat slave. Um, Jesus has his feet anointed by a woman, like Odysseus having his uh, feet anointed by his nurse Eurycleia, and she recognizes him from his scar. And the name Eurycleia means renowned far and wide. And it's said of this woman who anoints Jesus that wherever the gospel is proclaimed, um, it'll be in her memory. So um, these parallels were so striking that I dared not give a new lecture on it because it hadn't been digested. And so I spent another summer working through the Gospel of Mark, creating criteria that where I might be able to make a claim that there's a literary connection. And at point after point after point, it became clear that Mark was imitating not just the Odyssey, but also the Iliad and also um, some uh, tragedian plays. And I translated um, Homer and Euripides and Plato for myself in order to compare the Greek of the, the Gospel of Mark with the Greek of these stories. And it was unbelievable what I was finding. I also turned to a study of Greek rhetoric and understood better how literary imitation or mimesis worked. Um, and it w- was... Um, People were taught how to write by imitating recognized models and to compare um, heroes in an activity called synchrosis. Synchrosis is simply a comparison to show that one character is similar but better than another. And of course, that's what's going on in Mark. Jesus is like Odysseus, but he's better than Odysseus. He's like Hector in his death, but he's he comes back to life. So the, that's a, a synchrosis, and it goes on and on. All right, all right, all right. Let's get the party started. And so everybody knows we have a course out. Dennis McDonald did an 18 lecture course with me here at Myth Vision. This is the first course I actually am involved in, which I felt very honored and privileged. That's the landing page. You can find that in the description as well. The course looks like this, and it's very thorough. Thanks to my wonderful wife, Ryan, for packaging it and making it look all pretty. 18 lectures, all of them are in 4K, extremely deep. If you're looking for a deep dive, that's the course. But today, we're actually going to be talking to some experts. And uh, I have Dr. Uh, Gregory Crane joining us today from Perseus Tufts and Dr. Dennis R. McDonald. And of course, my uh, honorary, you could call him PhD, that <laughs> friend, Neil. What well, did we do it all the time, right, Neil? Yeah, <laughs> we do. We get all the scholars who go, you guys deserve like an honorary PhD for all the work you do and what you know. Not even close. <laughs> we don't, we feel extremely uh, humbled by it, but we don't, we don't uh, try to reach for it. What did it say in Philippians 2? He did not think it worthy to grasp equality with God. Okay, we're, we're not grasping. Yeah, equality. but he also became obedient unto death. You don't want to go there. <laughs> right, right. Well, welcome. Two greats are here today. Um, welcome to Myth Vision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Dr. Crane. Our goal today 
is to put some stuff before you you may not have considered um, coming from Dennis's work. And it's not mm-hmm. that you have been reluctant to try and pay attention. I honestly do think it's going to sound a bit conspiratorial, but I do think that Dennis has been ignored purposefully um, because what he is proposing flips everything people have built on its head. It's hard for them to factor in an entire different genre of material. They love going, it is written, and that's real easy to go to Hebrew Bible. Uh, Very difficult to say these people were that sophisticated to have a complexity of ideas from both the Greek novels, epics, tragedies, etc., and Hebrew scripture from LXX. So um, Dennis has obviously blown me away. I am fully convinced that he has certain, there are certain I'll say stories and narratives in the gospels that I am convinced of. There are others that I'm not so sure, but it's not that they aren't the case. It's just, they're not as strong, but if you've already been convinced of the strong stuff, you at least have to say, maybe he's right about this. I don't know for sure. Anyway, um, giving a plug to our audience for you. And uh, I'm going to bring up our little shared screen here. First of all, the book, Sorry, I got to stop sharing the screen and reshare the screen. Give a little plug for you all. But here's the book. I hope everybody will get a copy of it. It's more of a guide or a tool than it is like I'm just reading a regular book. Very complex. He gets into the Greek. He he does stuff in this book that nobody has done. Uh, translating certain works like the Byzantine Chintones, uh, the Homeric Chintones, if you will, and the Byzantine writings and stuff. There's certain things he translates that haven't been translated before in this book. And I hope that our audience will get a copy. Can you tell us about your website, uh, Dr. Crane? Yes. Well, we built a what's a digital library. Uh, I've been working on this for 40 years. Uh, we're best known for our collections of Greco-Roman antiquity. Uh, but we also have a number of other collections which are visible there. Uh, what There's you see name. here... Is, a, is an older site that's been in operation for quite some time. It is in the process of being replaced. And in fact, I'm skipping a meeting, um, retiring this website and going on to the next version of Perseus uh, to attend this, this conversation. Wow. wow. So uh, anyway. This has been a, by the, I just want to just jump in real quick just to say that this website is probably the most, yep. the most useful tool that I have in my tools that I use just as somebody who's amazing dependent. I can't tell you how much I I use it every single day, every single day. I'm always going on Percy and stuff. Me and my friends, we call it Alice. Let's see what Alice is like Alice in Wonderland. Let's go deep into Alice to see what the, what these use, these words were used for in certain contexts. Any word you click on the word, it'll say Plato used it for this text or, uh, you know, Kelsis used it for this text. And it's just, it's, it's like going deep into Alice in Wonderland, looking at all how these words were used throughout time. It's amazing. Gregory, I not only use it like that, but my students have. And um, because it's online and it's available through university, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, sources, um, it, it's been really a marvel. And uh, our, our, it's a real privilege to be able to talk to you. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's, I, I just want to say something about this community and it, your, your kind words there. Uh, I grew up in one of the richest cities in the United States, Greenwich, Connecticut. And I became fascinated with Greek when I was in high school, Greek and Latin, but Greek in particular. And at that time, it was impossible, literally impossible to put your hands on any sources in the richest, you know, public library in the richest city in the country, roughly. Uh, you couldn't order them. They weren't in print. So I really developed a passion for making things available to the broadest possible audience because my model is always my, myself as a, ch- as a younger person. So seeing uh, uh, you know, Derek and Neil, in particular, who are not in you know, a- academic institutions, able, saying they're able to engage with the primary sources in this way is like really makes my life. So, yeah, of course, yeah. As does this whole the fact that you're having this this kind of true intellectual, you know, venue. So it's super exciting to me. Yeah, beautiful. Well, we're we're here to roll out the red carpet. Of course, even Dennis is rolling out his red carpet for you. Um, but we're also hoping, uh, in hopes that 
using all your critical faculties, but that you actually are engaging and seeing what we say today. And we'd love to get your take by the end of the episode or even by the end of a certain example um, to say whether or not this is convincing to you or not. As somebody who's coming at this neutral but loves the Greek world and yet knows, of course, the Gospels go right into the same category because they're Greek literature. Yeah. Um, so we want to get your take at the end of the day. And I want to promote people to go support what you're doing, check out your website. And then of course, Dennis, the last person I want to give a little plug to is my dear friend, Neil. Neil's been working very hard. Neil has a YouTube channel for those who don't know who might be new to myth vision. Cause we've got some new people joining in. Go subscribe to Gnostic informant. He's my sidekick. Um, me and him don't agree on everything under the sun, but we love each other. And I, he's my brother. And I hope that more people will see that and recognize that even if you disagree, um, with things that I might say, or he might say or whatever, but go subscribe to Neil. He's in the description as well. And he has a late night gnosis, kind of a clip channel where he does shorter little clips from look right. Here's Dennis McDonald, how the gospels, well, we're getting a little hype with the with the titles, but how they <laughs> steal from Homer, right? We're, we're yeah. right? Dennis McDonald, of course, uh, Bart Ehrman, et cetera. The list goes on, but go show him some love as well. Now that we've done our little shameless plug, gentlemen, is it time we dive into the deep end? Sure. Should we enter Alice in Wonderland now? <laughs> yes. All right. I'm, I'm down. Dennis, would you want to start with the the demoniac narrative? No, let me start with the uh, Eurycleia episode. Okay. My favorite one. Um, th th this, uh, Gregory, was one of the uh, real gems that I found later on in doing my investigation. And uh, this is a story that is very well known to you, but probably not to most of the viewers. And so I'm going to take liberties in reading a summary of kind of uh, data points in the narrative that go uh, for, uh, with Odyssey 19, the Niptra. And then I'm going to compare it with something in the Gospel of Mark, and I'm going to do it serially. So I'll do the Odyssey story first um, to create a narrative and then look at the, the equivalents in Mark 13 and beginning of 14. Can we get it on the screen while... And if you, if you want me to read it, I'll read it for you if you want. No, this is a different list uh, okay, than okay. the one you've got. All right. So is so just to be sure, I'm on the right thing here. Let me get this right. Did, are you guys seeing the text? No. Oh, now it, there it is. Oh, you just brought it down. There okay. It Go ahead. Okay. Is it conspiracy to kill 193? Uh, yes, but if you scroll back a page or two, um, you'll you'll see an excursus. Um, and that'll have some of this material. So um, I've got the wicked vine. No, 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 go, fo go forward a little bit. Sorry for this. A generous widow. No, no, no. Keep going. Keep going. Excursus 25 no. marks. Okay. There it is. Uh, the anointing woman right there, right there. Okay. Okay. Odysseus has kept his identity a secret from the suitors so he can avoid, uh, getting killed. Um, for the first time in 20 years, Odysseus is going to see Penelope, and he goes to his house with uh, Telemachus, his son, who is amazed at the great light that shone on the walls of the house. Uh, Telemachus goes off, but Odysseus goes to Penelope and sits down. Penelope, in private, questioned her husband, who's still in disguise, and Odysseus uh, answered um, and then gave her the signs that she had asked, the samata, um, that he had seen her husband and uh, when he might return. That very day, Odysseus was consulting the oak sacred to Zeus at Dodona. Quote, he is near. That is, he himself is near. All the, again, a quote, all these things will come to pass. Tada Panta Telestai. No one in Ithaca knew if or when Odysseus would return. The suitors were prepared to kill Telemachus and Odysseus. The suitors feared harm from the people of Ithaca. After uh, giving his prophecies to Penelope, Odysseus, disguised as a beggar, sat by himself. 
Eurycleia entered with a bowl of water and washed her feet. Later, she anointed him generously with oil. That's a quote. When he recognized, she recognized her master, she dropped her, uh, his lip into the breast vessel, spilling the water. She alone recognized her king. Melantho, the uh, wicked uh, slave woman, had objected to Penelope's generosity to a poor beggar, it's, um, and she committed a monstrous act. The name Eurycleia means renowned far and wide. Odysseus and Eurycleia discussed the disloyalty of some of the female slaves then. Here's the Markin story. Dennis, by the way, just a quick question. Are you reading from this page that we're no, looking I at? No, I am not. No, okay, I'm not. Just, I'm sure. reading from something I prepared for today. Got it. Um, Jesus keeps his identity a secret so that uh, his opponents cannot kill him. One of Jesus' disciples was amazed at the great buildings in the Jerusalem temple. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and sat. Four of the disciples in private asked him about the destruction of the temple uh, and Jesus answered and gave them the sign, the Simeon, when he would return. That's the equivalent of um, uh, Semata in, in Homer. The disciples should consult the fig tree, like Odysseus consulting the fig, the, the oak at Dodona. Quote, he is near. Quote, all these things will take place. Pantatata genitai. Quote, it's like a man on a journey. Keep watch because you do not know when the Lord of the house is coming. End quote. Quote, the chief priests and scribes were seeking some deceitful way to arrest and kill him. The authorities feared a popular uprising. After giving these prophecies to four disciples, Jesus sat at a table at the humble home of a leper. And Odysseus had spent his time with Eumaeus, his swineherd. A woman entered with an expensive stone jar of ointment and poured the contents on Jesus' head. She broke the jar to release the oil. She alone recognized that Jesus soon would die. People at the meal objected to the woman's extravagant anointing. The ointment could have been sold uh, and money given to the poor. Jesus then says she has done a beautiful act, a kalanerga, uh, ergon, uh, whereas it was a uh, mega ergon that um, Melantho had committed. Jesus declares that what she has done will be remembered wherever the good news is preached. Eurycleia means renowned far and wide. Um, quote, then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest for the purpose of betraying him. Now, this cluster of um, motifs um, are dense, they're sequential, they're meaningful, and they satisfy many of the criteria of mimesis that I've um, incorporated into mimesis criticism. And I think it's um, very difficult to explain these similarities in terms of a common genre. Can I just jump in to emphasize a few things real quick yeah because we haven't we have the sequence ha happening in both texts where in 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 both texts you have either odysseus or jesus basically predicting the future in a sense involving a tree then yep. immediately followed by both of them having their feet rubbed or anointed by a woman in this case in the case of odysseus it's eurycleia the woman that anoints the feet of Jesus, he, she's told that her fame would be told far and wide. Eurycleia, which is the name of the woman who rubs Odysseus' feet, that word in Greek means fame far and wide, which means it's almost as if Jesus is literally putting a pun on the name of the woman who anointed the feet of Odysseus. Right. Now, in the uh, synopsis, you will see actually my translation of some lines from the Homeric Gentones. Uh, and uh, there, these uh, authors are retelling the story by using lines. What page from, is that, Dennis? Um, if you scroll down a little bit. Is it um, right after the actual? Yeah, because this is the blocks that compare both stories. Yeah. Uh, keep. No, no. Um, 
I don't. I thought uh, it was in the four hundred and somethings. Um, it could be. Oh, that's right. It's we, in. Yeah. It's in kind an of, I kind of do want to let people be able to pause the video and look at this so they can see it. it really, it's kind of important, I think. So these are the comparisons, and there's sequential. There's he has seven criteria, Doctor Crane, that he is like methodologically trying to say if it meets these, it's strong. Some of his examples, obviously, Dennis, I don't even have to speak for you. You you say aren't as strong. Like you admit you're not even yeah, sure, sure if some of these really meet the criteria in terms of are they really something? Is are we stretching a little, or maybe it is something we just can't prove um, that that's the case. But with your methodology, this is one of them that is at the upper clear comparison. Yeah, that's right? right. Yeah. Let's if uh, Professor Crane, any thoughts on this so far? Well, I just want to point out that as I was following along the passage in Mark, uh, Mark 14, 7, uh, uh, I actually noticed the word that I hadn't realized was there because we, I'm familiar with the idea, you will, the poor we will ha you will have with you always, or we will have with you always. Uh, and the Greek is, you know, always, for always you will have uh, the so-and-sos with yourselves. But it, the word they use isn't the word I would use for poor, it's beggars. It is, in fact, precisely the same word. That yeah, that's true. Business, which I hadn't <laughs> expected. So uh, there are other. So yeah, I, again, I'm not. I don't want to overemphasize it, but it did catch my eye and make me pause for a second in this context. Well, actually, I was debating that, but the other type uh, cases of tachos um, in Mark indicate it's more of a class of poverty. I sell your goods and give to the patoy. So um, mm -hmm. it's it just try, it's a matter of consistency. But you are precisely right that the word that is used for Decius as the beggar is ptochos. Mm. Can I read these boxes? Or well, did we you already kind of go so. over them? Yeah, we just did so. But um, sure, you can. Just to briefly summarize for the audience again, the Od Odyssey 19 is on the left. Mark's narrative is on the right. Why don't you read a this Odyssey? I'll read Mark. We can just go back and we can just keep copy. And we can, you, they can hear the story back and forth. From, okay. From, right. I won't be able to read the Greek. So if you want to butt in on that Greek there. No, no, no. For, ignore the Greek. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, people who know go. Greek can see. Me and Neil are going back and forth here. Yeah. Lemachus was amazed at the great light that shone on the walls of his house. Odysseus interpreted the light as the presence of Athena. One of Jesus' disciples was amazed at the great buildings in the Jerusalem temple. Jesus predicted that these buildings will be destroyed. Odysseus went to Penelope and sat. Jesus went on the Mount of Olives and sat. Now, I could see why someone might go, okay, some of these aren't like verbatim. like, And that's the point. None of it's Xerox copy. Anyway, Penelope in private questioned her husband in disguise. Four of the disciples in private ask him about the destruction of the temple. And might I add, of course, Jesus technically in Mark is disguised. Nobody really knows who the hell he is. Good He's point. purposefully not known. Anyway, um, Odysseus gave her signs that he had seen her husband and that he would soon return. Jesus gave the sign when he would return. That very day, Odysseus was consulting the oak sacred to Zeus at Dodona. The disciples should consult the fig tree. He is near. He is near. All these things will come to pass. Until all these things take place. No one in Ithaca knew if or when Odysseus would return. It is like a man on a trip. Keep watch because you do not know when the Lord of the house is coming. The suitors were prepared to kill Telemachus and Odysseus. The chief priests and scribes were seeking some deceitful way to arrest and kill him. The suitors feared harm from the people of Ithaca. The authorities feared a popular uprising. After giving his prophecies to Penelope, Odysseus, disguised as a beggar, sat by himself. After giving these prophecies to four disciples, Jesus sat at the table in the humble home of a leper. Eurycleia entered with a bowl of water to wash his feet. Later, she anointed him generously with oil. A woman 
entered with an expensive stone jar of ointment and poured the contents on Jesus' head. When she recognized her master, she dropped his leg into the brass vessel, spilling the water. She broke the jar to release the oil. She alone recognized her king. She alone recognized that Jesus soon would die. Melantho had objected to Penelope's generosity to the poor, not showing hospitality to Odysseus, the beggar, was performing a monstrous act. People objected that the ointment could have been sold and the money given to the poor. Jesus told them she had performed a beautiful act. Eurycleia means renowned far and wide. Penelope told her that one who welcomes strangers will have fame far and wide. Jesus said, wherever the good news is proclaimed throughout the world, what this woman has done also will be spoken of in her memory. Odysseus and Eurycleia discussed the disloyalty of some of the slaves. Then Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests for the purpose of betraying him. All right. Let's talk, I guess, briefly yeah. again. Thoughts on um, Professor Crane, obviously. What's your first reaction to that? You know, there's more elements there than I would have thought of. And there are things like the, the odd... Si- episode with a light on the walls in the Odyssey, which is kind of a strange, uh, I've always found it to be a bit of a, a strange, unmotivated action, uh, but it's showing some sort of divine presence. Um, I'll say that, that, first of all, a general thing about how people would think about this kind of comparison. Um, there was, there's always been a tension uh, for, you know, since the beginning between Christian literature and non-Christian Greek literature uh, and you know, attention among the early Christians about what you should be reading and thinking about. Uh, but that would really be stronger later on when there was a Christian literature to focus on uh, and uh, wouldn't be the case when the Gospels are composed early on where there was very inventing this thing. But a, a thing that I think everybody needs to think about is that the com- Anybody who was educated and spoke Greek would, in fact, have grown up probably memorizing, you know, with large chunks of Homeric poetry in their heads. I was just reading a grammar, a Greek, an ancient Greek grammar, uh, talking about how Greek works, and uh, I went by Dionysius Thrax, and I was just surprised to see that he uses Homeric Greek. I mean, Homeric Greek is not standard. Uh, but that's what you're using to learn your own language, even though it's an earlier archaic form. Wow. So when people come to uh, assess parallels between things in the Homeric epics and things in the New Testament, I don't. I think you really have to. You would really have a hard time having in your own head a sense of what kind, how sensitive people would be to these these similarities. Because you'd really be much more primed for in a way that no one can imagine. Why? Is it and fair I, to say, Dr. Crane, that what's happened in New Testament studies, in your estimation, is that we've gotten so caught up on focusing on this kind of Judaism, and we've got to find LXX and scripture, and like we almost forget they're written in Greek. It's almost like we've lost the fact that it's it's in the zeitgeist of the Mediterranean in which this material is coming out. So nobody's denying. Everyone knows Dennis most of all. And I think they think he's only focused on Greek. They haven't read his work. He's clearly saying, I know LXX. His teacher like, is one of the famous ones who showed the mimesis and Mark going to, um, going to Elijah and Elisha and, and showing the, the Bible. But Dennis himself is saying, Yes, yes, yes. And let's look at this. And this is what makes him unique. So what do you think of that? Do you, am I right in assessing that New Testament scholarship is doing themselves a disservice by not noticing what you're describing here about the Greek education and knowing this material? Well, let's just think about how people, the, for, the, the formation that most people receive. And I'll go back just historically, the invention of, of the kind of study of, of 
Greek and Latin that we do in the United States, you can go back to 1776 in Germany, where a young man uh, by the name of Friedrich Wolf walked across Germany to Göttingen, matriculated, and they said he said he wanted to study philology. Uh, and they said, kid, this doesn't exist. And, he, and they said, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to read Greek and Latin. And they said, oh, you mean theology? And he said, no, because if I study theology, I have to be orthodox. And I want a space where I don't have to be told what to think and how to think as a good Lutheran. Uh, and you know, it's not clear this event actually happened the way he described it, but it does reflect a split. So when I was, you know, as, as uh, Dennis was studying at Harvard, uh, I was there was a complete separation of the New Testament world from the, the classical Greek and Latin world. That's exactly right. And I remember being kind of shocked when I was a graduate student when I, I started to work with the Harvard Theological Review and Helmut Kester. Yeah, yeah, he was my thesis advisor. Yeah, and and I'd already taken biblical Hebrew with, with, with T.O. Lambden. But yeah. you, know, you, would, you would go there, it was like a parallel universe. It was like a Star Trek episode where <laughs> there are these two unit groups that are living in the same space and don't know anything about each other. Uh, Gregory, let me give you a story of someone you know. Mm -hmm. um, when uh, I made some discoveries uh, with the Acts of Andrew, which I edited, um, and some Homeric and uh, Euripidean parallels, actually some Platonic ones too, with quite fascinating work. Oh, these, um, Andrew becomes the new Socrates and so on. But um, I became very good friends with Albert Lord after he retired. Um, and you remember you, he had a, an office at Widener. So we'd uh, go over there and then go to the faculty club for lunch on uh, many occasions. And uh, one of the takeaways with him was, how is it, Dennis, that the Homeric epics, which are so foundational to Greek identity in the Roman Empire, in the, uh, in the early empire, um, is entirely absent in the literature of the study of the New Testament. Um, and, uh, and he said, somebody's got to correct that. Now, um, I'm hoping to correct that. And um, uh, Albert Lord was such a dear man and such a phenomenal scholar. His approach to the epics is different from mine because of his uh, oral formulaic uh, commitments and so on. But he certainly knew the literature well and was a champion for such singers of tales. Um, and so th that has stuck with me. Now, I may be wrong about half of my uh, suggestions, but um, I'm not wrong about all of them. Yeah. And it doesn't require that the reader or the author is a first class intellectual. It's a, it's a part of the social identity discourses um, and um, struggles. So I think they are kind of wannabe Virgils in the Aeneid, or where Virgil in the Aeneid is carving out Roman identity by a synchrosis with the Homeric epics um, and doing mimesis all over the place. Um, that uh, early Christians are carving out their own social identities by crafting narratives that are uh, that represent a synchrosis with the heroes of the Greek world. Now, they're not trying to deceive anyone, but they're not trying to write histories either. They're trying to um, craft alternative narratives to uh, sustain the images they have of their own in-group and various out-groups. And the best way to do that is to take what was known and what was the most popular thing in the world, at least at the time, and and what everyone worked off of. By the way, James Tabor showing love in the chat. Dr. Tabor says, don't forget, A.D. Nock was there, but maybe after your time. This, his two-volume collection of essay, essays is stunningly enlightening for Hellenistic mystic motifs. Good to see you in the chat, James. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, but one of the things that uh, is different is that, uh, by the way, uh, New Testament scholars now are not ignoring Greek and Latin literature. 
but they're uh, using Greek and Latin literature that is more or less contemporaneous with mm -hmm. the New Testament mm -hmm. and ignoring uh, Greek poetry and not just Homer, but also the tragedians. Mm -hmm. um, and as you know, and as <laughs> Perseus Project is trying to correct, um, archaic Greek is a different kind of Greek than Koine Greek. And it's, um, it takes certain kinds of uh, special training to be able to uh, be facile with, uh, with poetry. So there's a kind of um, allergy to poetry, I think, in the study of early Christian texts, unfortunately. In the study of it. A um, couple super chats here. I want to get these before we get to... One of my favorites, the Polyphemus Circe and the demoniac story. I love this one, and I hope that I'm not only getting Dr. Crane on board with this. I, I suspect he might have already a, a glimpse into it, but I'm, I'm wanting to get the audience, the 210 people, to vote in the chat whether Dennis McDonald's work convinces you it doesn't or you're on the fence. And so hopefully by the time we do some of this, you can change your vote if you said no or – if you go from no to on the fence, that's even better than saying absolutely no. But I, I am interested in getting people to see. And if they don't see it, I can't make everyone. Constellation Pegasus says, why didn't the Greeks recognize a copycat scenario and reject the Gospels? How much authority the Greek gods have on the population at these times after the last Gospel was written? I assume the general population knew these Greek stories. Well, um, the last point is clear. And we Yes, the general population knew these stories. Now, why, if they recognized the similarities, did they not reject the Gospels? Because the Gospels are not presenting Jesus or the Apostles or anyone as identical to the Greek models, but as superior to them. So it's a matter, uh, again, of synchrosis, of a kind of competition. Now, how much authority did the Greek gods have on the population uh, at these times? Um, it depends on what one means by authority. Certainly, this literature had an authority. And uh, we have lots of skepticism about the Greek gods. We have forms of atheism in antiquity. We have lots of popular religion about the um, the gods, but people knew about the gods, and um, early Christians engaged that. By the way, Jews had done so earlier than that, too. And so um, you find in 3rd Maccabees, for example, um, the, um, the Jewish uh, god is compared um, positively against Dionysus, um, so that one finds a struggle among the gods and early Christian and Jewish heroes. And uh, so the, you don't reject the Gospels. You actually um, appreciate, if you're in that in-group, you appreciate the differences because um, your team uh, hero is better than the other team hero. Mm -hmm. And then one more constellation. Thank you for the love today. Can't put my finger on why these evidently educated authors wrote the Gospels. They're so late in history. It seems like they were rebelling with counterculture, rebels of sorts to change something. And they did in a huge way. Yeah, they are. They're changing something. That's why they're invested in this. The same way that um, Virgil is trying to reshape um, uh, ancient Trojan identity to make it congenial to the uh, uh, reforms under uh, Caesar and uh, um, Augustus. But you also see this with going back to the ancient Assyrian Sumerian texts where they're taking, they're taking texts from Enlil and, and Anu and, and then making it in the Marduk and change. It's like, there's another, it's, 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 it's sort of similar. I don't know if you'd call it a mimesis, but it's, there's definitely polemics happening. Well, and the Greeks that called, old God was good, but our God did the same thing, but it did it even better. Well, sometimes the Greeks called that uh, zelos or, or zelosis, um, that is uh, rivalry. And uh, so yeah. mimesis can be both sympathetic, but it can also be agonistic. Um, and to engage a culture is often to engage its mythologies. I'm with you. Yeah, we see it with e even if it isn't opposing um, like you'd imagine different type of tribes or different people groups. You you look at the Anzu myth with the, the mythological bird that predates Marduk. 
you can see even in their own society, they were doing it to their own myths. So that's right. That's and right. the same thing with the Jews. I imagine they did it to their own. And this is why you have, I think, so many competing rap rabbinic writings of like how to interpret and they're doing it with their own scriptures. So there's all sorts of fun stuff. It's complex. It's not just simple. One, one of my Harvard professors, Albert Hendricks, actually did a, a, a beautiful study of um, not having one Dionysus and not just two Dionysuses, but a whole uh, slew of them. Mm. And so that Dionysian tradition um, was really quite plastic. Hmm. Are you ready to get into the Cyclops, everybody? <laughs> no, I want to hear uh, a little more from uh, Professor Crane. Okay. Yeah, I would too. Okay. Okay. So so I'll, I'll, first of all, I, I will admit I'm really, um, I find this very compelling for a, a variety of reasons where I'm predisposed to find it compelling. I've already mentioned the fact that the people who composed the, the Gospels did not live in a Christian, not Christianized counterculture that had emerged and was self-sufficient. They That's were right. living in, uh, as products, at least linguistically, of a Greek linguistic and literary culture. That's so right. they you, later, a couple hundred years later, you might be able to to separate yourself off a bit, uh, but not then. So this was their world. Secondly, you know, my view of the Iliad and the Odyssey, which I developed, you know, when I was doing my dissertation, was I, I really believe that the Iliad and the Odyssey are rips on um, that split up the Gilgamesh epic uh, yep, in. Yep two different stories and that I, I ended up studying Akkadian, Sumerian and some Hittite because I came to see archaic Greek culture as part of a network of interacting cultures that extends well into the Middle East. Uh, they, you know, uh, the Yale uh, Greco-Arabis um, uh, or one Yale uh, Greco-Arabis said that the, the West begins at the Hindu Kush. Uh, and nice. there's some, I think there's a lot of truth in that. So the idea that if you're pro producing the Gospels, that your reference point would be the Iliad, the Odyssey, or Odysseus and Achilles, you know, I, I'd be surprised if it wasn't. And the only surprising thing is that you do not get the kind of explicit engagement with Greek poetry in the Gospels that you would see in other contemporary literature. So, um, but that doesn't mean it's not going on. Well, um, you're familiar with the uh, the word um, "east of the helicon" by West, and so on. He makes yeah. a, a uh, he makes a case quite similar to yours. Hmm. Yes, and that was that was I, I was happy to see that when he started working on that. So, um, yeah, nice. I love the way that you you said that, and and please interrupt me if ever I'm bloviating on, on a subject or something, because I love hearing what you're saying, Dr. Crane, and I'm sure you're going to have a lot that we can learn. I know I'm learning every day. I talk to Dennis and I know I'd love to connect with you more often. And me and Neil, Neil was really telling me about you. And I was like, okay, we need to talk to him more. Um, <laughs> we need to get you in, uh, especially with the work that you've done. So I'm really appreciative of you being here. And I found Professor Crane, actually, weirdly enough, in this text right here, it's a landmark Thucydides. Oh, and, I, oh, yeah. and, I'm and I'm reading in the back and there's an appendix, there's an article about, well, I, I don't know if you call it an article, but it's a chapter about religious festivals in Thucydides. And I was like, oh, this, and it was, a, I was really, it was really well written. And, I, and then all of a sudden it says, okay, Gregory Crane, classes department, Tufts University. And then, then I, then I went to, as I'm always doing, I'm always I'm always going on Perseus Tufts, and then I see the name on the corner of the screen. I was like, "Oh my god, it's the same guy!" And then I, that's why I looked you up on Twitter and <laughs> reached out to you to get you on because I was like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, "It's the same guy." This is one of those weird coincidences. Yeah. Thank you again. Um, I'm going to get to this fun story here, and this this story really, when I first heard it, before I had met Dennis, I was like. That's pretty cool. I had no way to know whether it was true or not. I even my methodology at the time was not. I had. I have to confess, I had come from just. There was no strict, rigorous methodology in my thinking. I just was trying to figure out what what was the truth, 
And so we got Mark's Garrison Demoniac and Homer's Polyphemus and Circe story, which take place in books nine and 10 in the Odyssey. They're the adventures. But of course, Jesus is on some adventures, right? He's on that massive sea, right? That sea of Galilee that Porphyry said, what are you doing, Christians? You made that up because it was never called a sea before you guys wrote your gospels. Hint, hint. Kind of interesting that they're calling it a sea. I've been there. You could see all sides of the of that lake, even though it is a big lake. I admit it. It's not this sea. And so um, Dennis got me thinking, and I was like, "All right, Dennis, let's let's dive into this." Do we, Dennis? Do we want to just go to the parallel boxes and maybe you give us an airplane view of what you're seeing going on, and then we can, me and Neil, can do the reading thing. Uh, I think you and Neil should just go ahead and read it. Sounds good okay. to me. Um, and so um, then uh, Professor Crane and I can uh, jump in when we need to. Feel free to like cut me off or anything like that. Me and Neil will do this. I'll start with the Odyssey 9 and 10. And just so that I do think it's important to say to those who've never read the Odyssey, don't even know what we're dealing with, there's two books here within the same uh, Homer's uh, Odyssey. Two books side by side. They're in chronological order. They're right next to each other. The first one, he goes to the island with the Cyclops named Polyphemus. And the and uh, the next story is going to be Circe the Witch. But the author of Mark would have known this story. So let me go well, ahead. Uh, let me interrupt you just to Please. say this. And uh, uh, Professor Crane certainly knows this. These two stories were imitated over and over and over again. They were taught by for um, literary creativity. And you found uh, imitations of both of them, for example, in Virgil, you have both of them imitated in the satires of Lucian, uh, which means that they were probably um, common property to uh, intellectuals, uh, Greek speaking intellectuals in the Roman Empire. So we're not talking about, um, you know, um, stories that are kind of tucked away um, in the battles of the Iliad, we're talking about uh, stories that are really quite uh, generative of other kinds of narratives um, that are riffing on it. And so what we find in the Gospel of Mark is a riff on these uh, really uh, popular stories. Thanks. Thank you, Dennis. All right, we're going to read it. You ready, Neil? Yeah, let's go. Let's have some fun, man. <laughs> Odysseus and his crew sell to the land of the Cyclops and of Circe. Jesus and his disciples sailed to the region of the Gerasenes. On the mountains of the Cyclops, innumerable goats grazed. Circe turned soldiers into swine. On the mountain, a large herd of swine grazed. Odysseus and crew disembarked. Jesus and his disciples disembarked. They encountered a savage, lawless giant who lived in a cave. They encountered a savage, lawless demoniac who lived in among the caves. Polyphemus usually was depicted nude. The demoniac was literally nude. Circe recognized Odysseus and asked him not to harm her. Odysseus, swear me an oath not to plan another plot to hurt me. The giant asked if Odysseus intended to harm him. The demoniac recognized Jesus and asked him not to harm him. I adjure you by God, do not torment me. The giant asked Odysseus his name. Jesus asked the demoniac his name. Odysseus answered, nobody is my name. Jesus I'm sorry, the demoniac answered, Legion is my name. Odysseus subdued the giant with violence and trickery. Circe's magic turned Odysseus' soldiers into swine. Jesus subdued about 2,000 demons with divine power and sent them into swine and then drove the swine into the lake. Polyphemus, the shepherd, called out to his neighbors. The swine herds called on their neighbors. The Cyclops came to the site asking about Polyphemus' stolen sheep. The Gerasenes 
came to the site to find out about their swine. Odysseus and crew embarked. Jesus and his disciples embarked. Odysseus told the giant to proclaim that he had blinded him. Jesus told the healed demoniac to proclaim what God had done for him. The giant asked Odysseus, now aboard ship, to come back. The demoniac asked Jesus, now aboard ship, if he could be with him. Odysseus refused the request. Jesus also refuses the request. Odysseus and his crew sailed away. Jesus and his disciples sailed away. Odysseus awoke during a tempest in the episode immediately following the story of the Cyclops. Jesus awoke during a tempest and calmed the wind and sea just before exercising the demoniac. And those are the parallels. And I, if I can just add one comment, Dennis, that I found fascinating, and it was recently that I heard you make the comment when you paralleled them. And then I love to I'd love to hear Dr. Crane's thoughts on this. Um is the, you, the legions represent, we know, Rome or the Roman army. Okay, these are soldiers representative in the name of the, the demon. They're cast into swine, little pigs, just like Circe transforms real soldiers, Odysseus's warriors, into pigs. And so this is too much for me not to go, come on. And yeah. then notice the pigs drown. Well, in the Odysseus story, the soldiers in that that uh, when the storm, the tempest bl blows the ship and they they literally drown, all the soldiers drown other than Odysseus. So you have in a weird way, of course, a rewrite, but it's clearly connected. I can't see how and, and I want to have one more caveat that I think is interesting. I'm friends with everybody and I interview massive amounts of academics. I had Delcy Allison Jr. on. And I did a history or not series, right? I consider him conservative in many respects, but he's also very liberal compared to a real, real fundamentalist or evangelical or something like that. And he's very smart. And he said, I said, what do you, what do you think about Mark? What's history and what's not? He goes, I don't know what to do with this <laughs> demoniac story. Cause he's a very <laughs> honest scholar. And, and I, I said it, it sounds condescending, but in my head while recording, him, I was like, I do know what to do with it. It, yeah, it's so yeah. obvious to me because I'm looking at sources you haven't even permitted yourself to really allow to be the answer. So mm. what do you say to this narrative? Well, I want to say I want to give you a footnote to that. Please. The insignia for the 10th Legion that, um, that destroyed Jerusalem and its temple uh, was the, the boar. There were boars wow. on the uh, insignia and in some of the. Uh, I did not the... know that. That is mind blowing right now. It's amazing. So no. wait, when was the tenth legion in service? From what? Well, you know? oh, it, it, well, under Vespasian and uh, and Titus. So um, oh, wow. they were they were the occupying uh, legion um, in Judea um, for the Jewish war. Wow, that is mind blowing. I did not know that. See, this is, this is. I should have said it in the book, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. Oh, Dr. Crane, what do you think? What's interesting that you, um, some people might argue that the fact that you spliced uh, features from the Circe episode and the Polyphemus episode weakens the case. On the other hand, it, it, what you get in the in the Odyssey are alternations between. Uh, threats of destruction and threats of set auction. Uh, you know, Lotus Eaters, uh, side. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah, that's and, right. And so, uh, and, and you actually, you, you can see how the same story pattern can flip. So uh, the most of Odysseus's men are killed by the Lystergonians and he is, his ships hangs behind everybody else. The rest of them go downtown and they go, they're led uh, by the, a princess who takes them to see the, the queen. The queen looks at them, does not like them, and they, they, they just turn to the giants and eat them all alive. That's this right. Is, oh, very good. Is met by um, Nausicaa, the king's right. daughter, and she says, "My mother, my mother's the one you got. You got a charm." And he goes in there, and this, he shows up. On a, he's hidden, made invisible. It suddenly appears. There is a, a pause, and he's accepted. 
Mm. But that's it's the same story pattern as the Lystragonians. Uh, well, you have the same uh, alternation of uh, feasts. Yep. You have cannibal feasts and you have um, fe feasts of generosity like uh, the Phiakians um, well, and, and uh, Menelaus and, and, and Nestor. Um, but you have the suitors who are eating people out of house and home. But uh, there's one more one could add. Um, in my reading of um, rhetoricians, there um, are letters of advice to uh, future um, authors not to be dependent just on one model, lest you be thought to be plagiarizing. Um, we, they don't have the same definition of plagiarism, but they did have uh, some suspicion of it. And um, then if you have more than uh, one model, uh, it shows your creativity. Uh, so um, it's like a bee that goes, you know this image, a bee that goes from flower to flower, connecting, collecting nectar in order to make um, narrative honey. Um, and there also was kind of a rule that you should never use more than three models at once in a uh, in a, a narrative. So uh, frequently you find combinations of two of them, which shows uh, creativity. You find the same pattern, by the way, in Virgil, where uh, Virgil seldom uh, imitates more than uh, three episodes in the same uh, episode. There are exceptions, but um, that seems to be part of the pattern. So um, some scholars have called this eclectic mimesis, or mimetic hybridity, um, and these are these are things that you no doubt have seen. Are you are you convinced there's something going on with this Gerasim demoniac story and what we're reading over here in Book Nine and Ten? I'm certainly convinced it's worth thinking about, and that it's interesting to think about, uh, and that I mean it's hard. I mean it, it, it's. It's like, you know, if I were using statistical measures, uh, sure. you can say, well, I've got something and the probability that it's random is 98, maybe 90, you know, one in 20, one in 100, whatever it is. But if it isn't statistically one in 100, that doesn't mean it's not, you know, there's not something there. Right. So are these, are these, are we seeing similar story patterns? Yes. Uh, did the audience, the people who produced these gospels, were they immersed in Homeric epic? Uh, certainly, yes, would be my expectation. How do you, and, and even how purposeful would they necessarily have been in if, or how, to what extent is this, this is, these are the ways in which they, they were taught to think. These are the things they thought with. Uh, now, Dennis points out, you know, a genre that's well worth, Re reflecting on which are rhetorical exercises or in grammar school you you know give advice to Odysseus uh, or give there it, you go yeah you know make up a story uh, a speech for Odysseus to Polyphemus so he doesn't eat his friends right uh, but you would be put in a, a, a position of active composition uh, based wow. on you know your understanding of the story or maybe you would have famous rhetoricians composing things like a defense of Helen who was considered that's right, right character. So if they, as, as Dennis said, these are not sacred cows. These are not things that you look, don't touch. These right. are things to think with. I like oh, by the way, there's a passage in Quintilian, uh, Gregory, that I uh, like a lot. Um, he's talking to rhetoricians about how to put together narratives like that. Um, and have a, uh, a combination of uh, two, comparing two heroes in, in synchrosis, um, probably, uh, well, ex obviously, in order to train them for the law courts, you know, how to say that your client is better than another. But when he encourages them to um, identify a model, and it doesn't have to be epic, it could be uh, whatever, he suggests a what I call a strategic rereading and rereading and rereading of the model so that it becomes digested. Um, and so that when one goes then to imitate it, it's not buchstäblich, 
it's yeah. you know it, it, it's actually more generative because um, you now like the cow can pull up the cud and chew it and um, and make something different. So I think we still are, in my view, I don't think the study of rhetoric is in a position yet to have what I would call a taxonomy of mimesis. You know, what are the technologies that go into it? Is it memory? Is it cultural availability? Is it this kind of strategic rereading? Is it a visual access to a text? Or is it all of the above? And my suspicion is it's all of the above. I was going to say, I was going to say, like, there's always the possibility that these stories are so popular and well known that when the new story is being constructed, it's almost like indirectly influencing the sequence of events and the stories being written in the same sort of uh, structure. And even if that's the case, it doesn't mean what your work is doing is wrong. It just means you're noticing this. So either way, even if it's not uh, directly trying to mim- um, my meme or mime, whatever, whatever you say that, even if it's not during that, doing that on purpose, there's still something going on, even if it's by accident or indirectly. Real quick, uh, Dr. Crane, I want to take this uh, criticism here, or at least what I find as a, as a good pushback to hype the uh, drama of our sequence right here on this episode. And that's by James Boswell. And then we'll get to Super Chats here in a bit. You are stretching, stretching, stretching is what Dr. Crane is actually saying. But he's saying it nicely. Do you, is that how you feel, Dr. Crane, or is James putting words in your mouth? It's it. I would say. It, I would say I. I'm not. I. I'd have to. I'm still thinking. And is to say, right. I'm. I, it's hard for me to say. Is this? You know, am I? Is this supposed to be intentional? Is it? Is it in the air, and the person's absorbed it? Is there something going on? Uh, and and I think what Dennis does is Dennis is Dennis. Your job is not just to give the you know it's not a court of law. You're not there just to give, you know, only those things which are going to put someone in jail or whatever. Your job is to say here's an idea, and I go to explore the idea in as many ways as I can, and come up with as much evidence as I can. It is up to you guys to think about it. Uh, and um, and and so. It really does, in general, challenge me to think about what the relationship between these different stories is. I and I would also need to go look at I, it, to me until I go back and look at the Greek slowly. That's right. Yeah, hard That's for true. me also from summaries to um, you know to, to decide what I think. And so for you know some of the things like this, the finer element where Odysseus wakes up during a storm. You know, that may be Aeolus, that may be, that's a little later. And so that's not quite in the same, is it, and to my mind, it doesn't feel to be quite in the same frame. So I'll, that's not as convincing as some other things. Uh, how the do- demoniac, and I don't know enough, I've not reflected enough on the demoniac myself, on that element as well, and how odd that is. Uh, I mean, I've, of course, I've heard this story, I, I went to, a zillion years of Catholic school. So, uh, you know, I know I've heard this story many times and my name is Legion uh, is in my head, but I don't know a scholarship on it. I don't know what it really means. Mm. Uh, I will say that I did think about at some point, I'd like to do work on something like a very simple concept. And I think it's relevant here, which is the idea of humility which you can take for granted in a Christ- Judeo or a Christian influence space. Nobody ever would have thought that was a good idea in the classical period. The word is tapenates, and that means being lowly. That's right, yeah. Low class. It means, it, it, I, I, I'm not going to use negative terms, but it would be a negative term. Yeah. Uh, and it's like saying, you know, I'm, I'm nobody. I, it's a, I, I can't tell you how shocking uh, to me the the building up of this the, this negative term into a positive quality the, the son of god god becomes flesh bad enough and then you're talking about that being top nos well christianity is a big like you know six its thumb in the eye of uh classical tradition of which it is a, in, in which it emerges uh and so there's this engagement but you it's so separate 
tends to be so separate that it, it, we don't often realize how, how disruptive and transgressive this is. But transgression means you're in a That's right. with something. Yeah. yeah, right. They're fighting against. And this is exactly what Genesis does with the Enuma Elish. And in fact, uh, Dr. Matthew Munger, who was just in the chat, he's a philologist and he knows like, I don't know, 13, 14 languages or whatever. But he's like highlighting this. I know Ronald Hindle's written about the anti-civilization approach of Genesis 1 through 11. Like while Babylon is all hyping and having the Opkalu bring civilization and, and, and agriculture and beauty and war and all that is a good thing. The biblical text is saying, no, bad, Tower of Babel, bad, civilization, bad. So they're, they are right. rejecting the, the, the bigger world in which they live. And I think the Gospels might be doing that same thing also by co-opting names and titles of Caesar, etc., to apply to their lowly king who will one day rule the world. So the least will be first, the, 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 the head will be the foot, you know, the, the, everything. Like you said, it's flipping everything on its head. But it can't do that if it doesn't work with the model in which it's opposing. Mm. So that's why I think the mimesis uh, position makes a lot of sense. But just getting to that, I know you're not convinced you'd have to really examine it, but you weren't thinking, oh, they're just stretching everything. This is all just uh, pulling pulling it out of his butt. That's not what you're thinking, right? No, no. And I'm, it's not – I mean what's the – what's a useful idea in this line of work? It's one that gives you a new reading. It's one where you see, you see, you've been reading, looking at these sources, and then you see patterns you'd never noticed before. And you have to stop and say, hmm, that's interesting. And then all of a sudden, I, features that you had skipped over and maybe vaguely thought, hey, what's going on here? Or you might not have noticed them suddenly come out in, in our full 3D relief. Uh, and you, it's like you have, you, your eye can see new colors, right. uh, and your senses have been expanded. So this is, um, I mean, you know, Dennis has written a lot. So a great, the best, best hits in a short summary are, are enough to get you thinking, but, and, and all any, I've done this also where you're trying to say this thing is alluding to that thing. You, you will, you could, they could be standing there pointing at it. And, and quoting, and you'll get some scholars will say no. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so uh, I want to I want to weigh in with this lat chat if I if I could please. Um, I have not heard um, Gregory Crane say that mimesis is not a part of ancient literary production. We know that it happens, oh, yes. um, and we also know that some parallels that scholars have drawn between two narratives are nonsense. And we so we know that. So we're dealing with a spectrum of plausibilities that go from um, random associations to strategic uh, imitations. And what we need then is um, some sophisticated criteria to determine what does this look like? Do we find other examples of it? So in this is not a response to Gregory, because uh, I actually agree with him, but it's a response to the chat. Mm -hmm. That such mimesis took place is not, in, it is not the question. The issue is with any proposed similarities between two stories, in this case, the Polyphema story and um, the Gerasim story, uh, are there enough points of connection and justification for making a claim that this is, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily a literary production, but it's a cultural um, rivalry uh, going between two uh, similar kinds of stories. Um, and if that's as far as we can get with this one, that's okay with me. I love it. Now, I do want to end one more thing before we get to super chats, Dennis. And if you can find the page number for the Byzantine, Chin, the Homeric Chintones, I would love for us to turn to that because I think in this particular example, there is one. Am I correct on that? Uh, yes. Uh, and I can find it pretty quickly, I think. Please do. I know it's in the 400s. So I'm going to go down and start. Okay. Scrolling. I've got it. I've got it already. What's the page number? 348. Okay, 348. Sorry. I thought it was in the 400s. All right, I'm going to find this. And this might really at least, because one 
criteria number seven in Dennis's methodology is to say, are there, cause look in the 21st century, we can maybe be looking for anything, right? Dr. Crane, we can, I can go and look at an X-Men comic and go, holy smokes. Did they know about something that anyway, you can make up stuff, but in number seven of the criteria, are there ancient Christian voices that know what Dennis is saying that are looking at this demoniac story and noticing the Homeric odyssey connection and this is an ancient byzantine what you said 348 348 is it homeric rewritten gospels by byzantine intellectuals and, yeah, and it's, it's to number 63 if you get once you get it up that let me read it because it's a little okay tricky. tell me to go forward or backwards here so I'm go like, up uh, go up go up go up a little there you go right there uh, stop go go back a little bit there you go. That's all we need. Okay. So, but, but when they are, sorry, go ahead. No, oh, no. Did you want to read it, Dennis? Yeah, let me read it. Go ahead. Recension two of the Homeric Centos establishes the setting for the Gerasene demoniac by borrowing with modest alterations the beginning of the Polyphemus episode, not a C9. But when they arrived at the area located among the Gerasenes, here there was a headland where a cave lay next to the sea with cascading laurel as though encircling it. In it, swine and goats rested at night, and around it a high tomb was built with large stones set deep in the earth, with tall pines and high foliaged oaks. Here slept a monstrous man whom a demon shepherded by itself far away. He did not engage with others, but lived apart and knew only cruel thoughts for he had been made into a monstrosity and was not like a man who eats bread, but like a wooded peak of high mountains that looms larger than the rest. The poets refrain from imitating Odyssey 9 for the rest of the poem. Instead, they switch to Odyssey 10 and the episode with Circe. So Jesus spoke, and the demons cried out and called to him, As you commanded, let us go to the cry of, of swine. So these, uh, by the way, these passages, as far as I know, have never been translated into English before. They're not usually considered because of a late date, and they are actually parasitic on Homer. They're, it, they're, they're very difficult to, uh, to assess um, positively. But um, I think one can say that these poets certainly saw similarities between the two stories. That's different from saying that they thought the Gospels were imitating Homer. Rather, they were ornamenting Homer to, uh, to make the Gospels more classy, I guess. So it adds at least the touch of saying Christians saw enough in the narrative of Jesus to say, hey, this isn't shockingly different from our ancient, like some of these seem to jump out of them, or at least some type of pattern that they would rewrite the Jesus narrative using Homeric. Uh, That's right. Yeah. I guess uh, dressing window dressing from the Homeric story into the gospel narrative. Correct. Yes. We know that that happened. And this is, I think a good, pretty good example of it. Does that in any way kind of, what would the, what does that do to your thinking, Dr. Craner? Well, I think it's pretty much in line with how I would think about it. I mean, I like the description. I think that um, I mean, I guess I don't. I, I'm just looking up the Cantones right now, which I've heard of. I, <laughs> I I think I can't even think if we've got. I don't even think we've got it in the the newer ver the newest version of Perseus. So it's not in my intellectual orbit. It sounds fascinating. Uh, and you've got these Byzantine rewritings, Christianizations of, um, you know, myth of Greek myths and Greek literary forms. But it does, if you have, you know, a Byzantine person making these connections, that certainly st strengthens the, prob the probability that other people will make these connections. Yeah. That's what I thought. And by the way, to tease our audience, we do have that course, Dennis. And we only went over two today. We only went over two. We went through Eurycleia and we went through the, the demoniac. 
there are several dozens and dozens and dozens of these where Dennis is highlighting and showing you and going in. And a lot of them, some don't have these chin tones. A lot of them do. The hemorrhaging with the black blood. It's like, hold on, that's not in our Gospels, but we see it in the Iliad. And so there's some really cool stuff that it's like, they're people who are playing with this. And if they're playing with it, it helps, at least, like you said, gives a little strength to what Dennis is doing. So any comments before we start Super Chats, questions, and things like that? I want people who are theologically nervous about mimesis to chill out. <laughs> because I'm not trying to get anybody to change their religion. I'm trying to educate them about a new possibility in appreciating these texts. Now, I happen to be an atheist, but I'm not an atheist because of this. I'm an atheist because of science. But I also am a humanist, and I appreciate what these authors are trying to do to make sense of the world. And it's unfortunate, in my view, that this work has been used ideologically uh, for religious controversy on many sides. Now, it really does call into question the uh, the fundamentalist understanding of divine revelation and that uh, Jesus did all of these things. Of course, that, that's, uh, th that's nonsense in my view. But these authors are doing something quite noble in, in their own way for their own culture. And they're trying to make sense of the world as we all are. So um, I don't want my work to be seen as ammunition in a culture war except the war against ignorance and intolerance. I can dig it. Any comments from you or do, are we can, can we go to Q&A now or? Let's go to Q&A. Awesome. Let's see where it goes. Um, you saw, forgive me if I butcher it. Thank you for the super sticker, my friend. I really appreciate the love. The empty cross. Shouldn't the Jesus's gospels even the best non-canonical gospels be taught in classics programs? Um, yes. And um, the classics ought to be taught in, uh, in seminaries. <laughs> Both agree. Thank you. Yellow psych. Thank you for the super chat. Is it true that Nonus uses oh. hallelujah? Amen for Bacchus and Diane. Dionys Dionysica, sorry. Dionysica. Dionysica. He does. Yeah. It's a fifth uh, century text, but I have a better example than that. Because Callimachus, in his hymns, in the third century BCE, uses it for Artemis. Oh, Amazing. is that right? I didn't yeah. know that. Revive the goddess, receive her prayers, you who are chosen rejoicing. Alleluia, goddess. Preserve Argos of Inakos, Alleluia Goddess, you who have driven out the horses, Alleluia Goddess, you who have driven them back home, save all the estate of the Danans forever. Well, actually, you have a, a reverse of this of, uh, statement by Yellow Psyche that I didn't, by the way, I didn't know that, Neil, that's interesting. I'll but in, in the um, Christus Patians, the, uh, the Theotokos, talks about her women comrades as a theosis, and they want to come together with their tambourines and give the avoe. So um, you have this crossover between um, Jesus and Bacchus or Dionysus frequently. Uh, and you find it already, by the way, in, um, in Judaism prior to uh, the, uh, um, the early empire. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think Nonus wrote a text about the Gospel of John. He, he wrote a paraphrase of the Gospel of John, and he did so um, before doing the Dionysiaca. And the presumption is that he held to both religions because the Dionysus of the Dionysiaca has Christian traits. But nonetheless, there's a devotion to, uh, to Dionysus. There's so much overlap in these religions. That's why I love yeah. about it. I yeah. love it. <laughs> uh, Prodigal Bastard, thank you for the super chat. I 
sometimes the names you you just got to read people's names here. Did Jesus competition? Jesus is a competition with pagan gods serve to elevate his Christology amongst early Christians. Well, I suppose that's for me. Uh, I don't see any evidence that Jesus competed with pagan gods himself. So the issue can be rephrased. Was uh, Jesus's competition with pagan gods in some of the Gospels uh, serving to elevate his Christology? And I think there's no doubt about it, in my view, um, that uh, you have uh, Jesus uh, dies like um, Hector. His father, um, <laughs> uh, Joseph of Arimathea, with his, his father's name, um, has to rescue Jesus's corpse. Um, but Hector's body lies in the ground and Troy gets destroyed. Jesus's body rises from the dead, but Jerusalem is destroyed. So um, Jesus here is um, um, surpassing uh, Hector insofar as uh, there's a resurrection uh, from his grave in a way there wouldn't be for Hector. So yes, I think as long as we can say that the portrayal of Jesus as competitive with pagan heroes and deities, by the way, it's mostly heroes, not gods, um, probably did help uh, shape the uh, the Christology of later Christians. I do want to mention to uh just a point of that again, the course that we've done. Uh, let me pop that up here real quick. That course, where is it at? Hiding behind our window here. Sorry. Uh, with Dennis goes into even comparing Hector and Jesus's death. We go through your examples, of course, and that is a fun one uh, about Joseph of Arimathea burying Jesus Prius pre, I'm sorry, going uh, with the help of, um, uh, was it Apollo that was helping him in terms of, uh, you know, getting through at night with the soldiers going to sleep? So no, uh, Hermes. 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 Okay. Yeah. I was thinking of um, uh, the Aeneid too, where they fly across the water. The God the flies with the, the sandals and stuff. <clears throat> There's all sorts of really cool stuff here to consider, but uh, yeah, sign up for the course. The link is in the description. You will not want to miss this. I'm dead serious. It will blow your mind because it's not just like we're not just boringly talking. There's music, there's visuals, there's we're bringing the charts up. Me and Dennis are going back and forth and there's all sorts of stuff to learn. Stupid, stupid whore energy. Hey, if you're going to pledge rise, you can't go wrong with Homer. Uh, again, th this is not plagiarism. This is mimesis. And in fact, um, the rhetorician said, when you imitate, make sure that you aren't so wooden that you could be accused of um, mindless plagiarism. So, um, but you're right. You can't go wrong with Homer, whatever you're doing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Prodigal Bastards back. When the Gospels have a parallel with the HB, what is this? The Hebrew Bible. Okay. And the Homeric poems in one story, how do you decide which is more likely to be the source? Good question. Good question. They both are. If you can make those parallels clear, they both are. We give you an example that Professor Crane already mentioned. Um, uh, Jesus is asleep on board ship. He wakes up in a gale and his disciples are, are fearful and so on. You have verbal parallels with the, with the story of Jonah. Okay, you have verbal parallels with the story of Jonah. The story of Jonah, though, is a very different story from what you find in the Gospel of Mark, and it, some of its elements are more uh, similar to the Elis uh, uh, story in, um, in the Odyssey. So um, I don't think it's an either-or, and I think we've been wrong in not recognizing uh, cultural hybridity and that these stories um, uh, get conflated with each other in new artistic creations. Hmm. It makes you kind of think, too. I mean, this is just, I'm just throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. Maybe, Dr. Crane, you can comment on this. But 
there's like this competition going on with against Appian and Josephus and, and, and Philo and, and like who borrowed from who? Oh no, you guys borrowed from my Moses guy. And others are like, no, you guys copied our, our Greek stories. We had it first. No, we had it first. Why is it that that competition's there? Is there not overlap? Hasn't Hellenism seeped into the pores of everyone to a point where you kind of, anyone can make that argument at this point. Cause there's such overlap, like you said, cultural hybridity, that yeah, there are differences, but there's so much that they're also sharing. You kind of have to ask where do they get this from. So I in, wonder in Eusebius that. in Eusebius's text called Preparation for the Gospel. There you go. Yep. He, he, mentioned, he, mentioned, he mentions how the uh, there are people arguing over who is first, Orpheus or Moses, and they're like, well, Moses is the son of or. or Museus is the son of Orpheus. That must be the Moses. And then the other, other people are saying, no, no, no. Orpheus was taught by Moses. So he has like a paragraph or two paragraphs, I think, talking about that. Well, uh, if I could add just one other footnote. Um, Clement of Alexander's preparatio. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. The um, um, exhortation of the Greeks. No, no, yeah, the Protepticus is a marvelous example of this hybridity and because he compares uh, the biblical characters with uh, uh, Greek characters and mythology in a very sophisticated way. If I had, if I could extend my career another 20 years, I think I'd want to do a new edition of the Protepticus he, because he, he, um, he, it, it really is an overlooked text for yeah. such kind of early Christian brilliant hybridity. He, he says in that text that Jesus is the new Orpheus singing the song of salvation. That's exactly right. Yeah. And I saw that. I, there's like, the, and you have Justin Martyr also saying, you know, the way you so talk about the sons of Jupiter and the logos yeah. and the Mercury. So there's these people, they're, they're, they're playing with these ideas. They're debating yeah. them back and forth. There you go. But there. I want to get Dr. Crane's thoughts on this. So first of all, I just want to, I can't resist saying to Dennis, I, I visited my 99 year old mother last week who's doing quite well. Thank you. So you, you know, don't skimp yourself on 20 years. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> don't, 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 don't give up on it. So, uh, but I think that this, on the, on the one level, you know, I think that the, you go, the, 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 much of the Hebrew Bible is so old uh, and, and dates from the period where there would have been separation, not a lot of circulation between what's going on in Greece and what's going on in That's the world. That's true. Yeah. So, so, you know, the idea of which is what first, they both are connected to this ancient uh, uh, Near, Near Eastern cultural space, uh, you know, linguistically and culturally. And that's why, you know, Akkadian was kept alive, probably is still being kept alive at Harvard by the Northwest Semitic philology, i.e. Old Testament people uh, who have to learn that language. Uh, but this idea of... Um, you know, this is something you don't, you do not encounter this, this, where are we, are we, you know, Jewish, are we Christian, Old Testament, New Testament, this is not something which is prominent in the discourse of um, people who study classical Greek to our loss. So when you're getting fired up about the Patrepticus, and I passed through uh, Clement of Alexandria and some of these church fathers, mainly and getting them ready for digital publication, and you really get me going, saying, "Well, yeah, maybe I should be working on this stuff too, because it's uh, this is a new kind of, yeah, you know, it's an enormous amount of fascinating material that is relatively unstudied, and it's also philologically very tricky, mm. and so that you are moving through three different moments in Greek um, in order to make sense of the, and it shows you how brilliant uh, Clement was." This is one thing I love about Richard C. Miller's work as well, Dennis, your, your, your buddy uh, who lives right there near you. Um, and he kind of works this model with starting making the point of Justin Martyr that you mentioned there, Neil, of we believe nothing different than what you guys do with the sons of Zeus or Caesars with their apotheosis and, and like eyewitness testimony. All of that is like formulated there in Justin Martyr's apology. But it's like, it's almost getting into the, are the gospels some type of fictional narrative? 
And, you know, there's this debate today. You can't get anyone to agree. Is it biography? Is it this? Is it historical fiction? Is it mythography? Is it this? Like, what kind of genre are we dealing with? I like his model because he goes, look at the preponderance of Christian literature that is doing what you're saying, Acts of Andrews, Dennis, where you see clearly it is inspired by Homeric um, literature. But it's also fictive. And he's saying, well, we should apply that at least – if you see the preponderance of it, it's fictive. All of this non-canonical, quote unquote, that we like to throw around because of orthodoxy. And we're supposed to get to these and go, oh, but these, <laughs> talk about these are the historical ones. And it's like they all wrote in fictive kind of genre. And you're going to say that you get to this force field bubble that, oh, but these aren't fictive. These are real actual historical memory and all the others are fictive. And I think that taking that model and approaching it and saying, why do we draw that line and go historical and then draw that line and go, Oh, these, by the way, that didn't make it into our Holy book. Uh, th those by the way, are just fictive. And that's why we don't accept them. They're not accurate. They're not true in the little, well, let's, let, let's be uh, just a little finer about that. Please. Um, there are differences among fictions. There are historical fictions and there are mythological fictions and, um, and then there are subcategories there as well. So um, fiction doesn't necessarily mean one thing. And not all fiction is mimetic. So um, we, one also almost has to be uh, treat every text sui generis unless you have some reason to, to say that it's different than to compare it to something. So um, because some people think, well, if it's fiction, therefore it's false. Well, no, it's it's somebody's f truth, and um, then they're <laughs> like, can you imagine? Way. And this is a bad analogy, but can you imagine someone saying, "Iron Man, the movie, that's false." Like nobody's questioning if it's literally historically accurate. We're all saying, "Are you know, look at the superhero who came out of the cave, who overcame all of the enemies around him, and such, or death itself." Nobody approaches it that way. But I think once it's become a tool. Uh, and become weaponized in the world, but it has become a tool politically in the empire, but also it demands you be like us or you're, you're this heathen or you're a uh, uh, goyim, depending on the kind of context you're in. You're, in, you're, you're this non-Christian. Um, th this is where I think you start having these problems throughout history. And now today uh, there's this culture war. Like you said, Dennis, you've got fundamentalist, radical fundamentalist. This is inerrant, infallible, accurate. And everything described in it is what literally happened. And that's the battle that I face all the time with. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. So, okay. Next super chat is Steven Sorensen. Any thoughts on trickster, deceptive gods, people in the Greco Roman world and specifically in the new Testament. I'm thinking of scholars like Michael Williams, Dean Nicholas, John Anderson, Mark given. Hmm. Thank you for the super chat. Um, well, there certainly are. Uh, I'll start, uh, Gregory, but uh, I, I'd uh, appreciate your help. Um, I'm familiar only with Michael Williams, not with these other uh, scholars. So um, I'm kind of out of it. But certainly there are uh, not only trickster deities, but most deities can be a trickster on a given day. Uh, so uh, taking various shapes and, uh, but uh, Hermes is a, is a trickster. Odysseus is a trickster. Um, and you find trickster also in not just an um, epic, but you find it in tragedy as well. Um, whether that, um, is helpful for the New Testament. Um, I'm not sure. The The theme of secrecy certainly is important. Um, by the way, you have tricksters also in Hebrew Bible. So tricksters are not unique to the Greeks. Um, but I'm not really quite sure what to do with that question, Stephen. I'm sorry. Dr. Crane, do you have anything? I mean, it's, it's again, I'm not... I have not studied the literature on tricksters. I just point out, you know, I grew up with a trickster named Bugs Bunny uh, <laughs> and Roadrunner. 
Uh, and uh, and they are very much uh, sort of bowlerized uh, versions of that. Uh, but you get, and, and again, I would recommend reading the, the Homeric Hymn to Hermes. Uh, there you go. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah. You know, where Hermes steals cattle. Uh, and, and, you know, Odysseus really is the sort of a counterpart to Achilles and the sort of the, uh, the, the, the mirror image. Uh, I think I'd like just to go back uh, to the question of, of what's historical. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, you know, unlike Dennis, I wouldn't, I'm not an atheist. I'm not sure what, I'm not a, an agnostic. I'm not sure what I am. Uh, but, um, I used to go to a, a church, uh, that, um, and the minister who was a friend of mine, every Easter would get very anxious and, and just go through the story and say, if this all didn't happen as described, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, and, um, and, 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 you know, I've read of at least one prominent professor uh, of theology who lost his faith because he found like, you know, trivial inconsistencies between the like, gospels. I, what kind of a faith did you have to begin with? Um, <laughs> And, That's and, a good question. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like pretty naive. And but I'll say that that the the European continuous tradition of European historical writing that survives begins with Herodotus, and the opening, the climax of the opening book, the center point piece of the opening book is the meeting between the wise man and the and the great king, and it's Solon of Athens and Croesus, the richest man alive. That's right. And it is it, it's an event that almost certainly did not happen because the dates are off by a couple of decades. Uh, but it's also one of the truest events in Greek history. I can teach, you know, at length about everything that happens here is true. It just didn't happen. Uh, and there you go. it's not mythological. These guys existed. But, you know, if you, if you pay attention to this and take it seriously, you learn an enormous amount. And that, to me, is history as opposed to a chronicle. Let me yeah. throw let me throw something at you because then you have this you have the aspect of uh, propaganda too. In these Sibylline books, we all know the Sibylline books throughout history is sort of like this tool of propaganda where it's like go and get Magna Mata from the Phrygians and bring her to Rome, and then you'll win the war. And like, do they really believe that, or do they the people believe that, and they're doing it for, to get the people? give people some hot better energy or to fight their wars what's going on with those texts and then also in the sibling texts you see them over time start off as traditional pagan stuff and then to become jewish sibling text then eventually they're just christian text so you could see even the sibling books convert their religion over time and but like the propaganda aspect of it what do you don't you think there's some there's that's something that should be uh challenged right what do you mean by challenge? I mean, doesn't it isn't it sort of, I don't know, isn't it sort of da dangerous to use religion as a form of propaganda, right? I mean, I, I guess I'm. I could imagine. Well, let me let me phrase it another way. It can be. Um, look at Daniel. We know Daniel fails. Okay, I think all four of us on here. What I mean by that is there are predictions. There's a date clock ticks it goes past that time what was expected didn't happen but as i've interviewed john collins and others on this they go well look yeah it failed but the point in desperation was to give the people hope that's right and during that there's a that propaganda actually may have given the people in the circumstance it's like a white lie if you will sure. or it's something like telling everyone it's going to be okay even if it's maybe not there's a sense in which you don't tell your kids everything on purpose, but I'm not even saying that the author didn't actually believe. Maybe they really did believe the end was soon, but they were giving hope to their people and inspired to do so, even if they were wrong at the end of the day. So there's a point in which it's that I could see that being good sure. and it can be useful or, Hey, telling your, your soldiers, you're half the size of the army you're going up against, but the gods have said, that we will be victorious and our children will be free. They will not become slaves. Today you fight, we win. You go in, you fight twice as hard than what you would have if you said, guys, we're going and get our asses kicked. Are you right. ready to die? No. like, <laughs> So you you kind of wonder, but there are times I imagine that, that propaganda is yeah, what Neil, Neil um, I want you to think about something, though. 
Um, I think your comments helpful, but I think there's a tendency too frequently, especially among Christian scholars, to think that texts are written to convince the outsider. I think most of the texts that we deal with are for admirers, for the insider, mm -hmm. so that even something that looks like it's an attempt to convert outsiders is, is also uh, or primarily intended to fortify the insider and to then establish the inside-outside boundaries that are needed for social identity. So um, I get skeptical when people say that uh, a certain text is written to convert an outsider. It's very hard to get an audience for a text from an outsider. It's much easier to get your audience from somebody who's an insider. Thank you, Seth, for that. The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost of Myth Vision. And then they said, so again, take my money. Well worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think of the Doubting Thomas story with, with what you just said. I would imagine the reader, you know, there's a lot of breaking the fourth wall in these books that I love noticing where they're like, hey, uh, you see Thomas and you feel that's why you believe. But it's almost like Jesus turns and looks at you and goes, but blessed are you, the reader, who do not see yet still believe. So you're right. I think it's persuading the insider to hold on, to be steadfast and don't give up. Uh, that's, that's, I think you're on the money. There. But it's not to say, I want to double back on that. Uh, Neil, it's not to say that there's not polemical literature. Right. There certainly is. And it is intended for the outsider. And the siblings have that propensity because they're claiming to be revelations from the Sibyl and not from an insider who's venerated in the community. So I think the sibling oracles may be something of an exception. Interesting. Okay, we have gone on uh, for quite some time, and we only did two really major examples. And even in the first example that you talked about, we didn't get into the uh, Chintones, which I think we could have. There's probably stuff there we never even got into. Anywho, um, this is the book. I cannot recommend this book enough. My, let me just give you an example why. My wife does not get into this stuff. She thinks we're a bunch of nerds sitting here talking about things she doesn't give a hoot about. This is honest. I'm being honest. She doesn't care. But this book, and when I've showed her the course and she had to help like formulate the course to put it in, she's like, I can get into that. That's actually exciting and enjoyable. So for whatever reason, what I do most of the time on Myth Vision is boring to her. But then when she gets this book and is listening to the course, she's like, I like that. Uh, I love how he focuses on the women and, and like highlighting women in a way that, you know, we don't hear typical like people who are talking about Bible stuff are focusing on the women. So I hope that people will take the time to get a copy of the book and and be prepared. Sign up for the course because you're going to want the book in hand while you're taking the course. Go to Perseus Tufts. Check out our friend Dr. Crane's website. Is there any other website we're missing here that we need to plug? I, well, let's stick with this for now. If you give me any links at the end, I'll add it into the description okay. of this video. And I want to do future stuff just exclusively with you, of course, to learn from you and talk to you about your studies and maybe you have something fun to yeah. go over. Um, thank you, Shadman, for that super chat. Dr. Dennis, you're a legend. Keep up the good work, they said. I thank you. Thank you. Um, please check out the websites in the description. Also the course, like I said, um, this put, I spent at least a month every day editing, putting a piece of me into editing this course. And you can see, you go and click it. Once you buy the course, you'll see, you can go in. Every single one is fully packed with information and it's in 4k. So the quality is impeccable. I mean, we go through, Anyway, 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 teasing people, teasing people. Um, I hope the people sign up and then subscribe to Neil. Thank you. If you haven't, go subscribe. He has two channels now, Late Night Gnosis. And of course, his main one is Gnostic Informant. But I want to allow all of you to have a final say to our audience and maybe to each other. Anything you'd like to end this episode off with discussing? Well, I'll, I'll go first and just say that, you know, I see this described as your life's work, Dennis. And I know that not everybody has been wildly, as wildly enthusiastic uh, as, as we usually hope they will be when we write something. 
but I think, you know, if this, if this is what you would consider to be your life's work, and I know you've done other things, you ought to be pretty happy uh, and, and feel like you've done something really interesting that will keep a lot of people thinking and engaging and delighted and seeing what have been separate traditions, seeing them in juxtaposition in ways they otherwise would not have done. Not surprising that, that somebody who is friends with Albert Lord, who I remember well, uh, would have this kind of a, have had this kind of a career. Well, I want to thank um, Derek and Neil for getting us together. And Gregory Crane, it's a pleasure to meet you. And I am such a fan of Perseus, as other people are. And um, this is the kind of conversation that I find um, lacking but in our two disciplines, that I don't think biblical scholars pay enough time, uh, attention to classics. I think classics, my experience of some classicists have been um, really um, patronizing to people who uh, study Bible. And I understand the history behind it. And actually, I've been a victim of that on the classic side as well as in my own field. But it's so important to have conversations like this. I, I, I think I'm a pioneer, but I don't think I'm a settler yet. <laughs> and, um, and I think uh, I'm waiting for um, people to come in and to clean up my mess, but, um, but we will push back some frontiers. And I think we're going, I think uh, if we can collaborate more like this in the future between the fields, we'll both be better off. So thank you so much for um, your intelligence and for your com lifelong commitments and um, create something beautiful for all of us. Neil? I just, I, this entire time, these, these two, almost two hours flew really fast for me because I really enjoy listening to his, the Mises theory, but also I want, it was, it was nice to get a real honest and good reaction in real time to this from somebody who's entrenched in the classical world. And yeah. obviously, you know, with the website. And so I was enjoying this whole entire time. That's, that's it. That's all I got to say. I, I have the, the poll. I'm about to close it. If you've been convinced based on these few examples, oh. or if you're on the fence from a no, or if you aren't convinced and you were, vote, vote now. I really want to get the honest numbers here in just a second. But I do want to say to you, Dr. Crane, again, thank you for being a guest yeah. and being cautious. Because if you would have, based on this episode with only two examples, been like, I'm, I'm sold, yeah. I would have been skeptical right. of your jumping to the conclusion, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. Because sure. Right, right, right. As academics, I've learned quite a bit from various versions of you, uh, academics, and oftentimes it takes chewing and really mowing over it. And I loved your response. It was at least it built curiosity for you to examine the Greek and say, maybe Dennis is onto something and maybe you have a way in formulating it uh, and packaging it that might be a bit different than Dennis. But if there's something there, I hope that you explore further and we can get you to come on and, and speak about it. I'll be delighted. Yeah. Awesome. I'm so, so grateful. I am too. All right. We're closing poll. Let's see what the poll looks like just to get an idea of where our audience sits. Are you convinced of Dennis McDonald's criticism? Mimesis criticism. 53% said yes. Wow. On the fence, 36% mm -hmm. and a no 10%. The poll mm -hmm. completed is 264 votes. Wow. I yeah, it's a lot of votes. So, Dennis, overwhelming. Uh, most people think yes, without a doubt. 36% say, I, I don't know what to do with this thing, but I can't say no. It's fair. It's fair. That's a fair. Sure. It's that's fair. A that's a big win. Yeah, and then yeah that's a big win. Are not convinced. And maybe they've read other academics as to why they're, they take a position, or maybe they're just not aware of your work enough. Who knows? Respect not that honesty, though. Whoever, whoever voted for no, I respect the honesty. Oh, the votes cannot be changed. I did not know that. Oh, so you, I thought that if you vote, um, you can change your vote. So maybe some people have been convinced and the, the statistics might be different now. I'm not sure. But 
I really appreciate you and everybody in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and again, if this is okay with you, play that promotion for your course so that people can actually um, be encouraged to go and, and sign up today and maybe get a copy of the book and stuff like that. And maybe next time we could do something with you alone, Dr. Crane. How's that sound? I'd be happy to do it. Thank you so much, everybody. All right. I hope you enjoy this. If you haven't seen this, you really need to stick stick to this. Uh, stay tuned. Here we go. Let me hit play. And it was astonishing what I saw. Jesus sails the sea with a crew, that is his disciples, that are not nearly as noble as he is, like Odysseus. Like Odysseus, Jesus keeps his identity a secret so his enemies can't kill him. The Jewish authorities play the role of uh, Penelope suitors. And they love the best seats in uh, synagogues, and they're willing to kill in order to uh, win the inheritance. Um, Judas plays the role of Melanthius, Jesus' turncoat slave. Um, Jesus has his feet anointed by a woman, like Odysseus having his uh, feet anointed by his nurse, Eurycleia, and she recognized him from his scar. And the name Eurycleia means renowned far and wide. And it's said of this woman who anoints Jesus that wherever the gospel is proclaimed, um, it, it'll be in her memory. So um, these parallels were so striking that I dared not give the, a new lecture on it because it hadn't been digested. And so I spent another summer working through the Gospel of Mark, creating criteria that where I might be able to make a claim that there's a literary connection. And at point after point after point, it became clear that Mark was imitating not just the Odyssey, but also the Iliad, and also um, some uh, tragedian plays. And I translated um, Homer and Euripides and Plato for myself in order to compare the Greek of the, the Gospel of Mark with the Greek of these stories, and it was unbelievable what I was finding. I also turned to a study of Greek rhetoric and understood better how literary imitation or mimesis worked. Um, and it was um, that people were taught how to write by imitating recognized models and to compare um, heroes in an activity called synchrosis. Synchrosis is simply a comparison to show that one character is similar but better than another. And of course, that's what's going on in Mark. Jesus is like Odysseus, but he's better than Odysseus. He's like Hector in his death, but he's, he comes back to life. So the, that's a, a synchrosis, and it goes on and on.